I'd like to uh, welcome you all to my talk on uh, intellectual property uh, and open source licensing basics. Uh, my name is William Morris. I'm an attorney. I have been assisting my clients for the past dozen or so years with software legal stuff. Um, let me ask one quick question. I'm getting uh, an echo in here. Is that because the mic is too close to me? Because this is, it just sounds a little odd. I think I can do that. Here, does that work? That works a little better. Slightly less echo. Anyway. Well, in any case, um, so I've been helping my clients for about a dozen years with software business legal issues, and that can be getting them patents if they've got some new software they want to protect. It can be uh, writing licenses if they want to commercialize their software, or negotiating if they want to bring in some third-party software or hire someone else to write software to implement their uh, brilliant ideas. Uh, defending them if someone has scurrilously accused them uh, of wrongfully taking their intellectual property, which of course my clients would never do because I advise them never to take people's intellectual property, which is uh, good advice in general. Um, what I'm going to do today, I, uh, I'm going to use a uh, technique that is going to be familiar, I guess, to anyone here who's been to law school, which, has anyone here been to law school? Or no? All right, so I'm going to be using a technique. I came up with this myself about maybe three, four years ago, where I'm going to tell pretty much fictionalized stories. So uh, they're not 100% true, but I'm hoping the not true parts will make them a little bit uh, better for illustrating my points. Um, and Ultimately, what I want to do is make everyone in this room sort of aware of the basic framework of intellectual property protection in this country, um, make sure everyone in this room knows some best practices and some pitfalls to avoid, and then talk a little bit about how that applies to open source. And the reason I want to do that is because everyone in this room works with intellectual property every day, and that's what you do. And intellectual property is something where uh, if you don't know anything, you are leaving proverbial money on the table and you may be uh, shooting yourself in the foot because there are rules and if you don't follow them, uh, it can come back to bite you when someone who knows the rules uh, takes advantage of that ignorance. So we're going to try and dispel that ignorance. Um, in terms of questions, by the way, uh, I am a proponent of the questions in real time uh, procedure. So I feel if you have to wait on your questions till the end of the presentation, Context is lost, you maybe forget what's going on. So if you have a question, please stop me and I will answer it then, um, rather than trying to wait until the end and perhaps something's been missed or I've just been unclear about what's uh, going on. So anyway, um, first story, I guess, uh, starts in about 2014. Uh, I was visiting the uh, website ashleymadison.com, as one does, and I was just uh, blown away by how innovative, I felt that their uh, searching and matching algorithm was. They are a, um, they're like a specialty social website, and so they match people up with each other, and I thought this was great. And so I decided, I have a, a background in computer science, I would never uh, hold myself out as an uh, expert, especially not in front of this group, um, but uh, I thought it was wonderful, and I said, I am going to uh, make my own version. So I reverse engineered it, and I implemented my own software that, um, practice the uh, Ashley Madison uh, matching algorithm. Uh, we'll call that the William Madison software. And it's a good thing that I did, because in my hypothetical universe, as in our real universe, by the way, um, Ashley Madison was hacked shortly thereafter in 2015. Um, but in my hypothetical world, unlike in the real world, they didn't just steal the subscriber database, um, they launched a ransomware attack. And they encrypted everything. And when I say everything, I mean uh, they got the uh, subscriber database, they got the software, source code, object code, uh, the developer version control repositories, essentially everything that was or had been Ashley Madison um, was encrypted and could not be accessed by anyone. Uh, the hackers demanded, I think it was 15 million in Bitcoin. Um, Avid Life, that's the parent company, I believe negotiated them down to seven. Uh, ultimately, the negotiation was moot because rather than releasing the encryption keys, they absconded back to North Korea and were never heard from again. Um, but before doing so, uh, they tried to get one more sort of revenue stream out of their hacking, 
and they sold the uh, Ashley Madison subscriber list. So they posed as a uh, legitimate data broker and sold it to a third party that bought it uh, from them in good faith. I think it may have been Match.com, I guess, in my hypothetical world, it might as well be. Um, and then they went to North Korea and were never uh, seen or heard from again. And so what we have is a situation where um, Avid Life, right, uh, they have this innovative algorithm, and, and let's say hypothetically they had obtained a patent on it, uh, but they don't have software uh, that actually runs the algorithm, so they, they know what they'd like to do, but right, no, no software. Um, they also don't have their subscriber list anymore. Uh, I do have software that runs this algorithm. I have the William Madison software, but I don't have a patent and I don't have the subscriber lists. And then of course there's Match.com, uh, which doesn't have the patent. Uh, it also doesn't have uh, the Ashley Madison uh, software. It has its own software, but that doesn't uh, run the patented algorithm. It does have the subscriber lists, but ultimately my world is hypothetically a much poorer place because no one has all the rights they need to bring AshleyMadison.com back online. Truly a scary and dystopian place. Um, <laughs> but what is their loss is our gain, right? Because they have sort of set up for us three intellectual property assets that I can use to talk about the three kinds of intellectual property that are usually used to protect technical innovations. Um, so the assets are the Ashley Madison algorithm, the William of Madison software, and then the Ashley Madison subscriber list. And the three kinds of intellectual property protection that are usually used to protect that kind of stuff are trade secrets, copyrights, and patents. So let's start with trade secrets. Um, you've got the uh, requirements up here, but essentially a trade secret is something, it has to be secret, all right, that's reasonably easy. Uh, it has to be um, something that gains economic value from its secrecy. So for example, uh, my shopping list. None of you know that, and none of you could reasonably find that out, but none of you care. It doesn't have any economic value, and so even though it's secret, it's not a trade secret uh, in terms of the law. And also, in order to be a trade secret, it has to be the subject of reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. Uh, and that will depend uh, on the circumstances, what those reasonable efforts are. Common ones are things that I'm guessing you are all very familiar with. So for example, having a separate uh, development server with your source code that IT people and development people have access to, but sales and marketing people do not, right? So only people who need it for their jobs have access to it. Uh, making people sign NDAs before you show them your secret sauce, that's another one. Um, various access control features. Essentially, what is reasonable under these circumstances to make sure that something that is confidential stays confidential, and that will vary from case to case. And so using those requirements, how do those work with our three pieces of intellectual property? All right, well, I will, I guess I'll spoil my, uh, my ending. Two of them are trade secrets, one of them is not. Uh, the Ashley Madison algorithm is not a trade secret. And we can have a debate about why that is. Um, I will win that debate because I'm the one telling the story and no one's actually talking back. <laughs> but, uh, but the, we can talk about, were they really, re was it really secret? Because I, William Morris, with my BS in computer science from 2002, was able to reverse engineer and implement it. Maybe that's not really secret. Um, maybe they didn't take reasonable measures. The hackers were able to get all of it. Um, but maybe they have a patent, which in my hypothetical they do. And patents and trade secrets are like uh, oil and water, or vampires and garlic, or I don't know, matter, something that doesn't, uh, work well together, right? You can't have both. And since they have a patent in my world, they do not have a trade secret. All right, so that's out. How about the William Madison software? All right, well, it is secret, right? None of you have it. Uh, certainly Avid Life doesn't have it. I mean, they can't get a hold of it without maybe breaking into my house if I've stored it on my uh, home desktop or if I was uh, doing this. Maybe I'm thinking I'll do a website so it's on my uh, AWS server that only I have access to. Um, so it's secret, and let's say that I, uh, I am using reasonable measures to protect it. So the stuff that I said before about uh, I've got some encryption, I'm not letting anyone else see it, um, NDAs. So my software um, is a trade secret, and of course it does have value. Unlike my shopping list, we know at least two people who would very much like to get their hands on it, right? There's Avid Life, because they, they wouldn't have to spend the money to re-implement it, uh, and there's Match.com for basically the same reason, and really anyone in the field of uh, these social websites, 
um, it would want it because if you're the only one who has the software, it gives you a leg up on your competitors because remember, the only reason I was visiting AshleyMadison.com is because I like their innovative technology. And so that drives more business and you know, it's a, it is an economic benefit if you have it and other people don't. Okay, so there's a trade secret. Uh, the customer list, also a trade secret. So that's something, right? We can go through the analysis. Uh, other people don't have access to it. It is in match.coms, wherever they store their uh, confidential information. Uh, they are a reputable company, right? They've been in the business, so we will assume that they are doing what you're supposed to be doing to make sure the stuff doesn't become public because heaven forbid you uh, suffer that kind of embarrassment. Um, and it, of course, does have economic value, right? There is a whole data industry, let alone being able to sell it to a competitor. Um, but the fact that this is secret information does give it additional uh, value for Match.com or for other people who might be interested in it. So that's a trade secret. All right, so we've got to, what does that actually mean, right? So I can say this, uh, these have trade secret protection. Um, but I, intellectual property protection is kind of different from actual protection. So if I encrypt something, it is protected from other people being able to read it because they can't read it unless they break my encryption. Intellectual property protection does not stop people from doing something. What it does is it gives me the right to sue them afterwards if they've done it. And so what I can sue for, if you, uh, based on my trade secrets, is misappropriation. And that is essentially if someone uses improper means to acquire um, my trade secrets. So the North Korean hackers, for example, misappropriated the uh, information from Ashley Madison. Um, or if you learn it from someone and you use it or disclose it, when you know or had reason to know that that person you got it from or that entity you got it from used improper means to get it, or they had uh, access to it that was authorized, but they exceeded that authorized access. So. That's kind of what a trade secret is. In my hypothetical, a match did not. They, they were a good faith third party, but if they had known, for instance, that these were people who stole it and then absconded to North Korea, uh, that would also be trade secret misappropriation. And then, since I have this trade secret and match has this trade secret, if someone misappropriates, you can sue for damages. They could sue for damages, um, bring sort of a lawsuit after the fact, uh, maybe have a settlement, get some money. Um, good luck to Avid Life for that. I hear it's hard to collect judgments in North Korea, but. Then again, I've never tried it. All right, so there's trade secrecy. How about copyrights? Copyrights are super easy. Um, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. All that means is stored in some way. So all the software you write all the time, it's in memory, great, that's enough. Uh, it also has to be at least slightly creative. And again, all the software you write, I'm sure is at least slightly creative, probably very creative, because we're all very creative people. Um, so everything you do, is copyrighted. Um, what about the things that I've done or laid out in my hypothetical? Well, the Ashley Madison algorithm isn't going to work. And again, we can have a metaphysical debate. Is an algorithm recorded because I described it, uh, or does it only exist ephemerally as I perform it? Uh, that debate, again, I will win it, but I'll win it this time also because that question has been answered for like 100 years. And the answer is just describing it doesn't mean you have a copyright on something. Um, also, the law specifically says you can't copyright a method of operation. So, so there you go. That's an easy one. Uh, my software, of course, the William Madison software, we just went into copyright uh, software is basically a no-brainer. So I had some creativity when I was putting it together. It is stored on a CD or on a server at my house. So we're good to go with that. Um, the most interesting one, though, is that customer list because factual information isn't in and of itself creative. And if they just have this information like stored alphabetically by last name, for example, um, there's really nothing creative about it. So a list of facts stored in an uncreative way, like alphabetically, not copyrightable, even though you might store it, even though the creativity bar is very low, because for that, there's no creativity whatsoever. You have to keep it as a trade secret if you're going to use IP protection for it. And then. Uh, the same kind of protection uh, as trade secret, uh, very similar at least. You don't have to show misappropriation. So if I buy something, if I buy some software from uh, one of your companies, but I don't have the right to reproduce it, and then I reproduce it anyway, that is copyright infringement, even though I didn't hack your systems in order to get it. Uh, also, if I make a new version of it, so if I sell someone 
uh, William Madison 1.0 and they make William Madison 2.0, but I didn't give them permission, that's an unauthorized derivative work. So if they make software based on um, the software that I have, that's also copyright infringement. Um, you do have to register it uh, if you want to um, sue someone, but shoot. Not, not so, not so. So when you register it, what you do is you, you oh yeah, so the question was, uh, is, it, is it the case that when you register something um, you, for copyright, you lose your trade secret status? For most things that is true, not for software. Software, you have to submit the first and last 25 pages of source code, and you can redact up to 49% of that to preserve trade secrets. So I know I've had some clients who say I'm not giving up any percent of my source code, and I'm not, but for copyrights there are measures to maintain the trade secrecy simultaneously when you register it. Um, the third one here is a patent. This is something so you have to promptly disclose your invention to the patent office. You have to give a complete description. This does kill your trade secrecy, by the way. Um, every patent is a public document, and if it's not fully disclosed, your patent is invalid. Uh, it has to be some kind of applied invention, so if it's, if it's something I do in my head, for example, that's not gonna, uh, gonna do it. I have to have some significant inventive contribution on top of that. And uh, it has to be innovative, so it has to be novel and non-obvious. And then the patent office, where we are, uh, has to um, approve it. So they go through, uh, they have patent examiners, there's about 9,000 of them, to make sure that it satisfies all the requirements. Um, of patentability, and then they approve it, you pay many fees, and you have the exclusive rights that are given by a patent. Um, somewhat similar to copyright and trade secret, so I've listed them there, making, using, selling, offering to sell. The biggest thing to know about a patent, though, is copyrights and trade secret, there has to be sort of a link to me, right? You have to uh, misappropriate my stuff or reproduce my stuff. With a patent, um, if they'd never seen my software and I have a patent for it, but they make a, um, a new software that performs my patented method, I can sue them for patent infringement. So it's very useful for something where either you can't preserve that because of the nature of it, like anyone could reverse engineer it just once you start selling it, um, or if you think other people might come up with it also, a patent is gonna be more appropriate than trade secrets or copyrights in general for that case. So that's sort of the basic framework for IP protection in this country. Um, does anyone have any questions on that, or shall I proceed? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So you can't copyright facts, like period. Um, what? So what you can do is you can copyright uh, expressions. So you can say, I have this particular. Um, useful way of organizing the data and then but here's the thing though if I get the raw data and I don't reproduce your organization of it I just dump it into some database in alphabetical order then I haven't reproduced the co the creative thing that you have so in this country there is actually database protection in Europe but in the United States database protection has been debated at various times but it's not really a thing for that reason because you can't copyright a fact um, I am going to go a little bit quickly on my own story, uh, the next story for sort of uh, commercializing and best practices for software development. Um, this is one, so again, 2014, which I guess was a very busy year for me and my development, I came up with an idea for software to help people get patents and make the process a lot more um, efficient. And what I did is follow what I consider best practices to avoid mistakes that I've seen people make, which I shall now share with you. And the first thing, job one, is I nail down ownership. Because the default rules for ownership of intellectual property are different from what a lot of people assume. People assume if I pay for it, I own it. The reality is if I make it or if I come up with the idea, I own it, even if you paid me to do that. So if I hire uh, someone in this audience and I say, will you please implement my software, uh, unless I have a got it there, a written assignment from you saying you're transferring it to me, you own that and I do not own that. And I also need to be careful because in addition to owning the copyrights, I need to say you're going to actually deliver that to me. 
So I need to actually get the software written separately from owning the intellectual property. Um, there is an exception. If a person is hired specifically to invent something and does it while acting within the scope of his or her employment, it's owned by their employer. Uh, I never want to rely on that exception. Um, whenever I'm working, and I always advise my clients, they should make sure they have explicit written agreements that say who's going to own the intellectual property, that's my client, and what's going to be delivered to them. Everything, including both source code and object code, explicitly named. So I guess best practice number one is to nail down ownership and to avoid the mistake of assuming the default rules will protect you because I've seen many times where they don't. Uh, job number two is staking your claim. Um, for me, this was getting non-disclosure agreements and filing a patent application. Um, so essentially, I wanted to preserve my trade secrecy. So non-disclosure agreements are one way to do those uh, reasonable measures. And I also wanted, when you have a patent application, if you don't file it um, before anyone else has the same idea and makes it available to the public, you can't get a patent on that. It's now considered prior art. So I wanted to get my patent application in to sort of stake my claim and keep my options open for down the road. Like if I wanted to get investment and investors said, hey, do you have a patent application? I would be able to say yes. Whereas if I waited, then I have to worry about timing, other people. I just wanted to get that in. Ultimately, this step is about not inadvertently giving something up. But as I've mentioned before, I don't think it's smart to leave money on the table, at least not because you don't know the rules. Now everyone here does. Can I ask time-wise where I am here? Twenty-two minutes in. All righty. So that's good because we're now about to enter into the uh, land of open source software. Before I do, are there any questions on um, what I have said so far about the best practices uh, for sort of implementing your innovative ideas? Yes, sir. No, it doesn't. Um, so, yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah. So, the question was Is there a clock started in some way when I file my patent application? And the answer is no, but I'm going to change things up a bit so that the answer is yes, and I'll explain. I'll, I'll, I'll explain where sort of some some of these clocks and uh, can come from that you were referring to. So, normally, if someone else makes it available to the public, you're done. So you want to get it before them. If I make it available to the public, so for example, if I had uh, not just come up with my idea, but I'd also implemented it and started selling it to people. Um, that gives me a one-year clock, and if I don't file a patent application within that one year, I've lost my right to do that also. So that's one sort of time bar that you can have against you. Um, another one is there's actually more than one kind of patent application. So what you are probably familiar with, there's a thing called a provisional patent application. And that is I describe my invention, um, but I don't have to lay out sort of claims saying, here's what I claim is my unique thing. So a patent normally will protect an innovative method or machine or article of manufacture, and I have to say, here's what I claim is my method, a method having steps A, B, C, and D. You don't need that in a provisional. It just says, here's how to make and use my technology. Um, and the reason you'd file that is to put a marker in the ground, so very appropriate for staking your claim. And when you do that, you have one year because your provisional application expires one year after you file it. And so if you file your provisional and you say, okay, it's a year later and I'm still interested in this, I want to continue investing, the way you would do that is file a non-provisional patent application for the same stuff. And that non-provisional has the claims and it's treated as if it was filed at the date of the provisional application. So if someone else has come in with the same idea between provisional and non-provisional, um, no problem because I'm treated as if I had filed it on the provisional, um, even though it was just a provisional, it wasn't the full application. I'm guessing that's what you are uh, familiar with from the pharma days because they're very big on uh, filing a lot of provisionals um, because it's, uh, it's, it's good to get their dates in and I think there's also some regulatory issues with the FDA which I will... Um, admit to not being an expert in. I do, uh, my background right is software, so I do software stuff, and I 
I don't think I've ever done FDA stuff. So I, I don't know all of the details on that, but I think that's probably what you were referring to with that deadline uh, for filing. Uh, no. In fact, a provisional application, so when I file a patent application, um, normally it will publish 18 months after I file it, so anyone will be able to look at it. Uh, if I want to, I can submit a non-publication request. In that case, it'll be held confidential until I actually get a patent. Provisional applications don't publish, period, because they expire after 12 months. So a provisional, unless it becomes public because you claim priority to it and then you're that non-provisional then becomes public. The provisional, if you just let it die, it's done. On day 366, nobody gets to see it. It will vanish into the ether as if it had never been. So anything else before we uh, move on to sort of an open source discussion? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so. The question was, when you copyright your software, things are constantly changing, so you've submitted what you're submitting, but how do you keep up with constant changes? Um, there are a number of ways to do that. One is just do nothing and assume that if someone steals something, it will be in that original thing, right? So if I um, if invented Microsoft Word, which I did not, but let's say I did and I hold the copyrights to that, and then I come out with Word 2.0 and someone steals that, um, they're probably going to be, re it, there's probably commonality between the two of them that I can use for an infringement suit. Um, you can also file sort of follow-on copyright applications. So you can say my Word 2.0 is a derivative of my work Word 1.0 and file another copyright application on that. Um, just sort of a, a word about practicalities, copyright applications are super cheap and really easy. So a patent, right, there's all these patent examiners, you have to convince them that it's patentable, um, you have to pay a patent attorney to write your application, the fees are thousands and thousands of dollars even if you don't hire a patent attorney. Um, copyright's not like that. It's You go online, copyright.gov, uh, and they have a, you can submit stuff electronically, and I think the filing fee is like $40, and there's none of this examination that goes on. So for patents, um, you, just from a practical standpoint, you often have to be somewhat more selective because they are much more expensive and involve documents. For copyrights, uh, my feeling is if you feel that someone, that this, it's likely someone will steal this, so make a reproduction of the uh, stuff that you distribute or make an unauthorized derivative work, um, why not copyright it? Because 40 bucks is so cheap to do the registration. And if you do register it before someone steals it and they then steal it, you can sue them and it's so much easier. You can get your attorney's fees. That's, in theory, you can without that, but in practice, it requires things like really egregious bad behavior. Um, you can get statutory damages, which means I don't have to show that I suffered XYZ economic harm because you stole it. I can look to the statute and say, okay, it's going to be between like 750 and 150,000, depending on willfulness. But I get something without having to actually prove um, that you've harmed me. I just have to prove that there's infringement that I had my registration. So it's, I, I would say, it is a good practice if you're concerned about it um, to do the registration. And I also tell my clients um, they can certainly pay me to do that, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, or more accurately, I will usually get a younger associate to do it. Um, but usually that's something I think you can do yourself because it is just a very straightforward online process. You don't have the uh, examination the way you do with the patent. So, all right, so let's talk about uh, job three, which is implementing this software that I came up with for patents. Um, now, I will say I'm not, again, I'll reiterate, I'm not a programmer or at least a good enough programmer that I wanted to do this myself. Um, and I wanted it to be good and I wanted it to be cheap because uh, I had sort of nailed down the ownership and my firm therefore wasn't paying for it, it was coming out of my pocket. Uh, and when you want it good and cheap, of course the answer is open source because they're gonna do it better than if you reinvent the wheel and certainly cheaper than if you reinvent the wheel. Um, from a, I'm gonna be talking about this mostly from a licensee perspective. Um, and of course everyone here is a licensee of open source because we all use Perl. Um, but from a licensor perspective, there's some stuff that you need to know, particularly if you 
are actually planning on enforcing an open source license, um, enforcement can be a little problematic. And here's the reason for that. So back when we were talking about our foundational stuff, and I was saying, what is intellectual property protection really? Well, it's a right to sue someone. Courts are good and good at and comfortable with transferring money from whoever's found liable to whoever sued them. They are reluctant to uh, enforce non-monetary stuff. Um, they're not as used to it, and there's tests that say you have to balance equities, and in general, um, it's easier to get a money award than it is to get what's called an injunction. Um, but open source, right, the GPL, artistic license, etc., none of these have money damages. And there haven't been a lot of open source license violation cases that have come to the courts, but when they have, one of the issues has always been, can you show damages? And uh, sometimes people have, and sometimes people have not been able to show damages. Um, from a perspective, you may not care about this because you may think you're never going to enforce your open source licenses, which is great. If you're gonna do that, by the way, though, please release it under something like the MIT license, because if you're never gonna enforce it, I'd rather be a license that my clients don't have to worry about being enforced because it has terms that, that cause them heartburn. So just make it a really permissive license and then everyone's very happy. If you are planning on enforcing it, um, you need to actually think about the enforcement though. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can try and do this. One, uh, I think um, I mentioned dual licensing up there. So dual licensing, let's say I, I have my patent software and I'm gonna release this open source. Uh, I'm not, but let's say I am. All right, so I release this under the GPL, but I'm worried about not being able to show damages. All right, I will also release this under a commercial license. The commercial license will say, uh, you will pay me X dollars for the initial license and then a royalty of Y dollars per month. And now if someone takes this software under the GPL but doesn't satisfy um, the terms of that, so they don't, for example, uh, distribute the source code or make the source code available to people, and I sue them, I can point to, hey, if they'd wanted to not do that, they should have taken out my commercial license. They didn't. I am harmed in the amount of the commercial license fees and royalties that I lost. Whereas if it's just purely GPL, I have to show there's non-economic damages, maybe I lose my prestige in the community. Much easier to say, hey, dollar figure, because here's what I was selling it for uh, to people who wanted to do this the right way. Uh, another way you can do that, so copyright registration. You remember I had mentioned that if you um, copyright a piece of software and register it before someone does the infringement, you're eligible for statutory damages, which means I don't have to show damage. Um, if I wait until afterwards, so if I distribute my software, then someone makes an unauthorized reproduction, uh, I can register at that point and then sue them, but I'm limited to my actual damages, which, as I mentioned, for open source can be uh, problematic. Um, ultimately, the right way to do this is gonna di differ from situation to situation. Um, there's also, for the copyright issue, there's also some um, kind of tricky legal stuff. So uh, when you're talking about a contract, there's things called covenants versus conditions. Uh, this is the reason I actually did go to law school. You don't need to worry about that, but if you want to worry about enforceability, you should talk to someone who does understand that kind of stuff because if you phrase things as a covenant, um, you can't sue someone for copyright infringement for violating it, but if it's a condition, you can. Um, and that's all I will say on that subject. So uh, if you care about it, that's kind of a tricky thing that you should uh, look at carefully, um, preferably with an attorney who's licensed in your state. But, um, if, but if not, like I said, just release it under permissive license and everyone will be happy. Uh, from the licensee perspective, so the main risk that I was worried about with my patent software is having to give away my source code, right? So I've mentioned the GPL a bunch of times. That's because this is essentially the boogeyman of open source software. When I talk to my clients who want to distribute software commercially, they've always heard of it and they're always terrified of it. Um, and so for me, what I had was software which I implement using a bunch of open source, right? So I, I need uh, an OCR uh, system. And I didn't, that was not my idea. I need it in order to implement. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I can use this OCR system without having to give away 
the, the fruit of my genius or what I believe to be genius. I haven't actually made any money. So let's, uh, let's assume that's coming up. Um, but what I need to do is I need to check, do I have to give away my source code? I have no problem providing notice and attribution like you do under the artistic license for my hypothetical OCR uh, module. Um, and really, I don't have any problem with uh, giving away the source code for that, right? So if it's under a license that says, I need to distribute the source code of the software that I'm using, or like the artistic license says, if I modify it after you give notice, I'm okay with that. Uh, what I'm concerned about, though, is does it apply to derivative works? So a derivative work you'll remember is a work that's based on some previous work. And the situation that I want to avoid, that in general you want to avoid if you're distributing something commercially in exchange for money, is I have used some open source software in putting together my, my package. Um, I distribute the package, and then because I incorporated this open source into it, I don't just have to give the um, source code for that open source software, I have to give it for the entire package because it's a derivative work of whatever it is that I just incorporated into it. That's what I'm concerned about. And so I have clients who will say, okay, what are the licenses that have both of those things? They require source code and they apply to derivative works, and then that's basically a blacklist, and they won't touch anything on that for any reason. Um, and that is not a unreasonable position to take, right? So from an administrative standpoint, maybe they don't want to make a decision every time. Um, it's easier to tell their developers, look, just don't ever use this than it is to have the developers come to them on a case-by-case -case basis and make decisions for it. Um, that's not what I did. So one thing that you can do if you're in a situation where you have um, some open source software that has these uh, characteristics that you do want to use is you can try and design around it. Um, and particularly with the GPL, the way you do that is through different architecture. So the GPL is, it's written so that the uh, source code distribution um, requirement only applies when you have propagated the software. And that means essentially I give you a copy of it or I make a copy available to, to you. So you could like download it off of my website. Um, the way I decided to implement this software because of that was as a SaaS model, right? So I have a website up and it has my patent software and you can submit requests to that software and it will give you responses but you cannot get a hold of the code for that software. It's just exposing an uh, interface to you. And because of that, it's not propagating the code, and I can use all the GPL I want because, great, I'm not triggering the source code distribution of derivative works. So I'm happy with that. Um, you have to, though, if you're gonna use that kind of a strategy, be very careful, because I've used the GPL as an example many times, but an open source license is just whatever terms the copyright holder applies to their software. It doesn't have to be the GPL. It doesn't have to be triggered by this propagation. It can be anything the copyright holder wants. And in fact, there is a very uh, popular, not as popular as artistic or GPL, but there's a license called the Afero GPL. And it is specifically designed for SaaS use of open source software, the theory being why should you benefit from my open source software without distributing the source code if you're doing it on a SaaS model? And so it says, if I let people interact with my software over a network, I have to give them the source code. Uh, that was my blacklist. So I, um, for, my, for my contracts, um, I wanted to know what open source was going to be in it. There was a term saying you're not going to use open source software without telling me. And I very specifically said you will not use a Faro GPL uh, software under any circumstances because I don't want to run the risk that the parts of that software that I incorporate might require me to give up the parts of that software that sort of embody my great idea. Um, and I think that's a, a reasonable approach to take, but again, All right, yeah, it's necessary to uh, look at the specific terms of the license you're dealing with before you make that kind of a decision because there is the potential that they can change from case to case depending on what the copyright owner wants. And uh, 
you don't want to assume that the terms of, say, the GPL will apply because they very well might not and you can end up getting burned for that. I'm going to put this back on. Uh, while I do that, if anyone has any questions, they can think of a great way to phrase them and then I will respond in a minute. Come on, guy. There we go. All right. Excellent. So does anyone have any questions about the um, sort of implementation of my patent software and the use of open source and open source licensing? Time? Yeah. No, you, you just... Yeah. Um, so, so on the GPL sort of, uh, question about using system libraries, uh, I will say you might be right. Um, so one of the things I've mentioned, there's been very little litigation about open source. So. When I was telling you about patents, like they have to be obvious and they have to be fully described, there's well over 100 years of cases that I can cite to say what exactly those things mean. That's just not true with any open source license. Um, there is actually a case about the GPL. It's a dual licensing case. Um, it just, it's very early on. They just survived a motion to uh, dismiss. They were say uh, the defendant was saying, well, you can't show damages, and they said, well, we can do a license, and the judge said that's enough in this case. But it's, there, there's very, very little litigation on this stuff. So I can't say for sure how a judge would interpret it. Um, I will say that the GPL is written uh, very aggressively, and I will also say that um, the Free Software Foundation, which is not an authoritative source, so it's nothing they say is binding precedent, but they're still very um, they're still very influential. Their FAQs regarding the GPL indicate that even when you're linking to uh, GPL libraries, that that can um, trigger the whole sort of overall work being covered by the GPL. And I think what they would say, and I don't represent them, so I'm not speaking for them. But I think what they would argue is that uh, if you want this sort of, if these libraries, the way to be safe on that would be to use something under the LGPL, um, which is written for libraries uh, ostensibly. Um, and I think they would probably take an aggressive position on the question of sort of the uh, uh, linking to system libraries. Um, I don't know, it would depend from case to case. So one of the things their FAQs say is they talk about the amount of interaction um, with the libraries and then the code that you write. 